Hello community, if you love AI, this is the video for you. Now, imagine a world where attention is all you need was never published. Self-attention was never discovered. Google never received a patent on the complete transformer architecture that powers currently all of our AI system globally. Now imagine Microsoft CEO whose complete AI infrastructure runs on the transformer architecture. Microsoft CEO would enjoy his sleep and not think, hey, what happened if Google decides that now Microsoft needs to take a transformer license and let's say they don't provide it for free to Microsoft. Let's say there's a small annual, you know, gratitude payment, as we call it, from about, let's say, $10 billion to maybe a little touch more. You know, Microsoft shareholder would also enjoy their sleep just this little bit more knowing that a company produces any profit at all with their AI business. So we have here this strong dependence of one competitor on the other competitor who holds a patent. Isn't this a beautiful innovation theory paradigm? So what do you think? Would Microsoft explore alternative AI methods? Well, of course, this is just an imaginative world. So therefore, we have to find a scientific title here for this video. And we go here with, hey, we'll talk today about the Transformers computational inefficiency on long sequences. So let's dive right into it. To tackle this, there is now the idea to substitute the transformer architecture, so the self-attention and the multi-layer perceptron, feed-forward network, everything. Throw out everything and have a revolution. Build everything from ground up. The basic idea is quite old. It goes back to the engineering times when we had here the state space models. Please note it is not the state space models, but it is the state space models, or as we call it also in mathematics, the phase space. So, 1950s, we are in control theory and there was the work from Kalman. And in his paper published then in 1960, he introduced here a new approach to linear filtering and prediction problems, what we know today as the Kalman filter. So this state space model provided a systematic way to describe the dynamic of a system in terms of a set of equations. And this set of equations represented the state of the system and how the state evolved over time. Now, let me make this absolutely clear. This is not the real mathematical physical way. Because, you know, in theoretical physics, we have the Lagrangian, the Lagrangian framework, the equation of motions of a physical system. It is a fundamental principle in classic mechanics, quantum mechanics, quantum field theory. This gives us an insight into the nature of physical systems. We are based here on the principle of the least action. And we have here a function, the Lagrangian, that encapsulates the dynamic of the complete system. We use here the mathematical symmetries and the conservation law of particular units. This is not what we talk about. We talk about an engineering approximation for modeling complex system in a control cycle. Now, you know the system as SMS, how the status of a system evolves over time based on if we change input data. Now, sometimes we are called this S2, so the number of S's here are counted. There's also the S4 model, the structured state space sequential model, where we have now an advanced mathematical handling of matrix and matrix multiplication and diagonalization of tensor structures, but please note, this is not inherently that this provides a true physical description of a system in the same way that the Lagrangian in physics does. So just to be clear, this is here um, approximation of a dynamical system. Beautiful. Now, a state space model is as easy as one, two, three. First, 
it models a dynamic system. Check. Second, it represents a complex system with multiple inputs and multiple outputs. And most important, it uses a set of two first order differential equations. So this is beautiful because first order differential equations are so easy to compute here in computer science. Yeah, we have a lot of methodologies and there's nothing higher. So there's no second order differential equations or n step equations. Beautiful, simple models. And third, if we have here a linear model, time invariant and a finite dimensional models, then the al algebraic equation can be written in a matrix form that we know from artificial intelligence. Easy, easiest. This is the most easiest example, a state space model. Great. Let's talk about them. So here we go. These are the equations. But you know what's even more important is the state space model maps a one-dimensional input signal, we call it U of T, to an n-dimensional latent space with X before projecting these latent space variables to a one-dimensional output signal y. And here you have the set of equations that describe the dynamical system. It's a linear case, so we have here four matrix combination A, B, C, D. And I will show you in a second, easy to understand what they are. So those SMS are broadly used in many scientific disciplines. Yes, yes, yes. Hidden Markov chains and so on. Simply use this as a black box representation in a deep sequence model where A, B, C, D are our parameters, high dimensional parameters, learned by gradient descent. And you know, also in the normal neural network, we learn by gradient descent. Beautiful. So again, the latent part refers to the internal state, you know that as x of t, which is not directly observable or measurable. And this internal state acts as an intermediary between the input and the output state. A and B are the matrices that govern the dynamics of the latent state, and C and D map the latent state to the observable output. As simple as this. Okay. The first equation we call the state equation, and the second equation we call the output equation. A is also called the state transition matrix, B is the input matrix, C is the output matrix, and D is the feed forward or the direct transmission matrix, just to know the nomenclature. Now look, this here is, we have here a simple system, and this is our real space, our three-dimensional space. But our state space or our phase space is a mathematical simplification that make, makes it even clearer. So the state space or the phase space is a geometric constructed space in which the variables on the axis, and here we have the velocity of our mass going up and down, and the position of the center of the mass are now here, the variables on the axis are, and those are the state variables. So the state of the system can be represented as a vector. And here you have the vector running around, the state vector within the state space or the phase space. So you see, we have now a reparameterization of the real space where we say, okay, this system has a dependencies of the state variables, velocity, and position. Position easy, where is the center of my mass? And velocity is the velocity of the center of my mass if we have here the center attached with a spring to the ceiling. You know the real space. This is what you see in nature. This is what we describe. And then we have a mathematically optimized, simpler phase space or state space where we can choose here our representation of the dynamic of the system with a generating functional or simply with the axis here in our phase space that makes it easier. Both space representation describe the same happening. So 
This here is from Wikipedia, it couldn't be simpler. So you have here Newton's law of motion for an object moving now horizontally in a plane attached to a wall with a spring. This is the equation of motion you know, but you see we have here a second derivation of our output vector according to the time step. Second derivations are computational expensive. But luckily, if you look at a control cycle or the state equation, this is here the identical description in a simplified version where we say, okay, if we do not need to solve here the second derivation, but we go with state equation that only have a first derivation given the different time intervals. So you see, we make it computational simpler. Now you understand the main point of the state space. Beautiful. Yes. All the different nomenclature. So again, this is the main idea behind all of this. So let me put it clearer. I have an input signal and I have an output signal. And in between, what you know is we have a neural network. An input signal is normally here a vector representation. And the output signal we then feed in a softmax contribution. Now we have it differently. We have an input sequence. We have an output sequence. This is a sentence in English. This is a sentence in French. And you want that the system translates this after he'd learned a lot of, lot, a lot of examples. So what we now have is a hidden Latin space. And for this space, we use here the SM. M methodology, the S4 methodology, to learn the parameterization of this space, to learn A, B, C, D. If we know the parameter, we know how the system behaves if time goes by, if we have input sequence, output sequence. This is now our new artificial intelligence network where we do not have the attention mechanism and we do not have the multilayer perceptron from the transform architecture. So you see, this is the basic idea that is always there. Beautiful, great. Now, the necessity of this Latin space in the SSMs arrive from several reasons, and dimensionality reduction. The observable data can be high dimensional and complex. As I showed you here in the phase space, we can have maybe just two dimension with velocity and location of the center of mass, or capturing hidden dynamics, or temporal dependencies. They are particularly powerful in modeling these temporal or sequential data streams. You can generalize it. It is so interesting that this Latin space is a really helpful tool for us. Great. Now here, this is what you know. You have an input u of t, you have an output of the system y of t, and then in the middle you have here our hidden Latin space. Now, b is now easy to understand. We have here the input data, and this is the input matrix that projects here the input data to our hidden Latin space. And c is now the projection from the hidden Latin space to our output space. Beautiful. Now you see here very clearly in this control loop cycle of a linear state space equation that the real description of the hidden Latin space is done by our matrix A. And we go from S2 to S4, we will see that A plays a central part. And this is also, if you want, A refers to the state transition matrix. Here you have everything, yeah, about dimension, yeah, it's important. We have a p-dimensional input, we have a q-dimensional output, and n state variables. The dimensionality of this system can be, we can program this, can be 1, 2, 5, 10, 768 dimensional. So here you see exactly x is a state vector here in a given dimension, y is a, is a vector, an output vector, also in a given dimension, if you have Q outputs, well, you know, guess what the dimensionality is. And then you have here the different matrix dimensionalities that you can conclude from this little diagram. 
Beautiful. Let's take the next step in the evolution. Remember, it started in the 1960s, 1970s, 1980s, 1990s, the 2000, the 2010, the 2020. And you understand there's a lot of things happening. So we make it really simple. We are now August 2022. We are now Stanford University, Department of Computer Science. And they say, hey, we understand that there was this beautiful state space model with our state space equation and showed that for appropriate choices of the state transition matrix or the state matrix A, this system could handle long range dependencies mathematically. Yes, however, it has some computational problems. And to solve the computational problems here, we propose here the S4 system with a new parameterization of the SSM. And in particular, we, fo we focus here on the matrix A. And we make it easy. Yes, yes, yes. So what they say, hey, S4. We focus here, we condition here A with a low rank correction. You remember Laura with a low rank adaptation? It is not the same, but it is theoretically similar. So we have a main normal part and we have then a low rank correction to this matrix. So we dive here deep into the mathematical tools and we find here a representation that makes it easiest for computing here this reducing the SSM to a well-studied computation of a Cauchy kernel. Cauchy, you remember, mathematics, if or then, you don't know, I asked ChatGPT, Cauchy kernel, beautiful. And if you really want to think this on an extreme simplification, what is S4? Great. Of course, this was the linear system. Now we move on to the nonlinear system. Now the same set of equations hold, but now we have not a matrix, but of course, this is a general function. So we are in function theory. Let's have a simple example. A classical nonlinear system tells us Wikipedia is a pendulum. And we have the equation of motions for a pendulum if we go with a Lagrangian and we have theoretical physics in all its beauty. And these are the parameters. However, if you want to have a simple computational, um, almost as good <laughs> calculation of this system, you can use the state equation that only have the first derivative of our uh, parameters to time. So this is a simpler way to compute here the internal dynamics and the state reactors and ABCD of the system, the representation of the Latin space. So you see two mathematical description, but one is computationally so easy. Beautiful. So as I told you, we have here the state space model. We have here our A, B, C, D. Now you know this. Then here in the center, recent years, continuous time memories for, yeah, captures empirically. And then here we have our SNM can be computed either as a recurrence or a convolution. Recurrence, convolution. Yes, yes, yes. And S4, as I told you, introduces here a mathematical optimization for the matrix multiplication. Beautiful. That's it. Yeah, if you want to know recurrent, please go to this literature. You have a recurrent representation. So if you have a discrete input sequence, U0, U1, U2 to Un, instead of a continuous function U of t, you can have a discretization by the step size delta, represents the resolution of the input. And then you can now have a continuous time SSM converts here to the matrix. And this here is now the equation three is now a sequence to sequence mapping instead of a function to function mapping. And this is what we are interested to calculate this because we will have an input sequence like a sentence and an output sequence so this sequence to sequence mapping is exactly what we're looking for. Beautiful. Now, however, if you want to calculate this exactly, the recurrent SSM here in equation three here is not practical for training on a modern computer hardware due to its sequentiality. You want to have here continuous convolution. So you can use your GPU in an optimized way. So you then modify this to a convolution representation 
And then you can use the fast Fourier transformation algorithms. These are standard programs you have in every Python library to solve the equation. So now you know recurrent representation and convolutional representation and what is their main function. This was S4. Now let's jump to S6, the latest step in the evolution of state space model. And here we have Mamba. Mamba is equal to S6. So we have here a linear time sequence modeling with selective state spaces. And here we have Princeton University, Carnegie Mellon University. And they tell us, you know, transformer half this computational inefficiency on the long sequences input output. And this is their problem. And we propose now a solution. And we say, hey, we integrate now our selective SSMs into a simplified end-to-end -end neural network architecture, but without the attention mechanism or even the multi-layer perceptron blocks. And we create something without them we call a Mamba block in this high-end neural network architecture. And say Mamba enjoys an inference that is with five times higher throughput than transformer and a linear scaling in sequence length compared here to a quadratic scaling. So let's have a look in of this idea if it's really the next big thing that will revolutionize all our AI model. And especially if you think about rag data, if we have now a linear scaling and sequence length, this would be amazing for the computational speed, for the easy, for the complexity. So again, we go to natural language processing. Let's say we have an input sequence is a sentence in English and the output sequence is a sentence in German. And the system should be responsible for the translation. Great. You know that our current LLMs transformer have a computational inefficiency with long sequences. And now they go with this Mamba architecture. And they say, hey, we use this SSM parameters now as a function of the input data, thereby enabling some selective information propagation along the sequences. And this is the feature that significantly improves the handling of discrete modalities like text. And then, of course, this is the software, the hardware implementation they find here a parallel algorithm that is optimized for this handling here of selective information propagation along the sequences. This is it. But it's not that trivial as you might guess. So what are the advantages? Mamba provides well, a six linear scaling in sequence length, faster inference. Great. They have now created here a Mamba 3 billion free trainable parameter model. And they say, hey, and I'll show you the benchmark data in a second, we surpass the transformer of a similar size and matches those transformer that are twice the size, and both if you look only at pre-trained and downstream evaluation. So really interesting that th from the architecture of the system, this architecture would allow us to surpass here the performance of transformers. However, okay, now before we go to the however, let's let's make it really clear. By integrating our SSM parameters that are now input dependent in the neural layers, Mamba or S6 can selectively focus on relevant input information in a sequence enhancing its modeling capability. This is something that is really where the system either breaks or shines. How can you do this, that the system focus, selectively focusing on relevant information in the input sequence? If you think about self-attention, you know it calculates each word to each other word or each token to each other token and calculate the attention score. But now Mamba is doing this in a different mechanism. And I was asking myself, 
How is this possible? What is this mechanism? I know we'll spend now some time on this. But what they sell, the argument is, hey, a member 3B model surpasses here the transformer LLM 3B model. And I will show you they use rather old LLMs specifically for long sequences, for long input sequences. So let's have a look at this. This selection mechanism. Where does MAMBA focus its SSM reparameterization on? How is this possible? So, the mechanism is akin to a filtering process where MAMBA decides which information to focus on and which to downplay or simply ignore. So this system ignores input information, selectively, specifically. It's achieved through a model gating mechanism which is essentially a set of dynamic controls to change in response to the data being processed and inputted. Therefore, if Mamba is trained on text data, it might learn to focus on nouns and verbs as the key parts of sentences while paying less attention to common conjunctions or prepositions. So the Mamba design allows it to consider not just individual pieces of data, but also their context within a sequence. Think about self-attention up at now, and it's a completely different way. So this means Mamba doesn't just look at words in isolation, but understands their relevance in a larger structure of a sentence or even a paragraph. Now, this is interesting, and this mechanism is really key to understand Mamba. And I was fighting with this understanding. In summary, Mamba learns to distinguish important information in the input sequence from non-important information in the input sequence through extensive training. It adapts in real time to incoming data, using its selective mechanism to focus on elements that it has learned are likely to be significant in the input stream based on its training. Interesting. So, now... I looked specifically at learning. So during this training phase, Mamba is exposed to a large amount of data, of course, information, which part of the data it learns, which part is important, making now accurate prediction or decisions. So in language, it learns that words or phrases are crucial for understanding the meaning of a sentence. And then Mamba uses now not the self-attention of the transformer, but now the selective state space models which have the unique ability to adjust the internal parameters, A, B, C, D, and delta, based on the incoming sequence data. So essentially, as MAMBA processes a sequence of input data, it continually adjusts how it treats it each piece of information. And these adaptabilities, like a person learning to pick up on keywords in a conversation to grasp the main points. So now the parameters... Lambda, A, B, C, yeah, D, we ignore for the moment. In the selective state space models, our SSMs are dynamically adjusted based on the input data, particularly focusing on the more significant parts in the input. And I said, okay, there it is learned, but what is the mechanism here? And I looked at the parameters. And we have here particular the delta parameter and the A, B, C, D parameters you know, but what is delta? Now, the delta parameter plays a crucial role in controlling how much the model focusing on the current input part versus retaining information from previous inputs. So a high value of delta might cause Mamba to pay more attention to the current input, effectively resetting its internal state, while a lower value of delta would make Mamba retain more information from previous inputs. So this delta is, if you want, similar to an attention score in the transformer network that tells us, hey, this is important, this is important, and this piece of input sequence is important for you. ABC, you know this. <laughs> okay. Now, the authors of Mamba give us this architecture structure. And they say, you know, it's, it went on for, for decades of research. So we have a lot of models. And they say, yeah, best if you take the H3 model and you combine it with the gated MLP model, this is now a Mamba block. So compared to a transformer block. 
it is rather easy. You have a linear projection, ingoing and outgoing, and in the middle you have a sequence transformation with a nonlinearity that learns here. So what we have? We have an input to our Mamba block, and we blow up this input space to a latent hidden space with more dimension to be able to find all the patterns and all the finer details in this space, vector space. Then we have here, let's focus here just on the SSMs. We have here our mechanism of the state space that finds now in the reparameterization a delta a b c and maybe d in this latent space we have now the analysis of the fine patterns and then we have an output projection a linear projection to the output space the output space is measurable so you see this substitutes here now our classical attention and mlp structure from the transformer network so this Control cycle derivation, SSM, is now responsible to finding here the relevant parts of the information and project it then to the output. Hmm, interesting. I'm still not convinced. I don't know yet. Maybe I'm simply not intelligent for this system. But okay. So the Mamba architecture represents a streamlined and efficient approach to SSMs in your network, combining linear attention, yes, cohesive, yes, yes, yes. And they respond to different inputs within a sequence. Okay. Okay. Let's look at the performance data from the orders. As you can see here, zero-shot evaluations, and you have here all our performance benchmark. Let's just look here at the last column, the average accuracy. Now we have a Mamba 130 million, Mamba 790 million, and a Mamba 1.4 billion, Mamba 2.8 billion. And they compare it to an OPT, to a FITIA, and a GPT Neo. It's based on GPT 2. So you see, it is not really the latest networks, although it is a really recent study. But okay, they will have their reasons. And then let's just look at the last. So Mamba. Let's call it 3 billion free train number parameters. Outperforms here compared to those other older model here. And here you look 59.6 compared to 63.3. Okay. Also the number 1.4 billion here, you see outperforms 55 to 59. So these are significant improvements. I have not the possibility to reproduce this, but we have to believe the authors in this particular task. So I tried now to write this together, also for you, Ben. So what is the core essence here? We have a novel, a new neural network architecture designed for long sequence modeling, integrating here the concept of dynamic modeling of selective state models to address here the computational inefficiencies of our traditional transformer model, especially here for long sequences. Okay, integration of selective SSMs in simplified homogeneous blocks, eliminating the need for attention or even the multi-layer perceptron blocks, inspired by the combination of linear attention and MLP blocks in a single block structure, leading to more parameter efficient and streamlined architecture. Each block in Mamba expands the model dimension by a controllable expansion factor, I showed you, and compromises most of the parameter in linear projections. There's a lot of linear projection going on to this high dimensional hidden latent space, while the inner SSM contribute less now from the parameter counting in this comparison. So this unique composition allows Mamba to effectively handle sequence transformation and maintain flexibility for integration into various neural networks. Employs here a specific activation function the authors found to be very optimal for the performance and fast inference and five times higher throughput than transformer with a linear scaling in the sequence length. 
this selective SSMs in Mamba follow or allow here an input independent parameterization dynamically adjust to the sequence input data in its processes. And this adaptability is crucial for tasks that require content based reasoning, allowing Mamba to selectively propagate or forget information based on the concurrent context. And remember, we already had this in the very old times. Do you remember this um, long, short-term memory? And so I said, hey, the selective mechanisms of Mamba's SSMS is linked here to these classical RNN gating mechanisms, providing here a foundation for this novel approach. By incorporating selectivity in the parameters delta ABC, Mamba gains a significant advantage in handling variable spacing in data and filtering context essential for managing long-range dependencies. And also to filter out irrelevant information in the input sequence string. Okay, then we have some comp hardware computation optimization for GPU memory hierarchies. Check. And then we have a new model. Okay. I look then here also for Ben, <laughs> but I already forgot this here. This gating mechanisms here in our, for example, the long short-term memory and the gated recurrent units. And in those models, the gating mechanisms control the flow information through the network. And those gates in the good old time decided what information should be kept or distorted as the network processes data sequentially. So we already had these gates in those older models before the transformer architecture with attention arrived. So now, after we have now our beautiful GPT systems, now people also look back and ask, hey, our old model, our old systems, our idea before GPT, before attention arrived, before Google invented attention, can we now use those for a better long-term sequence dependencies? So in state-space models, the selection mechanism plays a similar role. It determines which part of the input data the model should focus on and which part of the input data our SSM can ignore safely. This mechanism helps the SSMs to be selective about the information that they continue to process, thereby improving the efficiency and effectiveness in the handling sequences. And then I checked. This classical gating mechanism that we see in the RNNs is essentially a specific form of now the broader selective mechanisms that we use now here in the modeling of the dynamic system in hidden Markov chain and especially here in the, our SSMs. So this means that the way our old RNNs use gate and the gating mechanism to manage which information can be viewed as a particular case or instance of how the SSMS selectively focus now on different parts of the input. This is interesting. So now we look back at the old system and we make now an advancement, a generalization of those LSTM and GRU models. Okay. Yeah. And for you, I asked ChatGPT4 <laughs> to explain what is an LSTM and what is a gated recurrent unit for you to read. Now, of course, this latent space, the dimensionality of this latent space is important. And we have here table 10 of the original documentation of, of Lambda, of Mamba S6. <laughs> You see here, <laughs> here in the top, we have now the state dimension, the n dimension here, the parameter in the computer perplexity of the system. And they say here, we have a constant b and c factor. And in the bottom here, we have a selective adaptive b and c factor. And they say increasing now the SSM state dimension n which can be used as an expansion factor on the dimension of the recurrent state, can significantly improve the performance for a negligible cost in parameters per blobs. So you see, if we have a state dimension 1, 2, 4, 8, or 16, 
their perplexity goes down significantly. Beautiful, our system performs. Compare this, if you keep B and C constant, the gain in perplexity is, is minimal. So please be aware, B and C also have to be selective factors. Great. So in summary, each member block expands the model dimensionality through a controlled expansion factor, enhancing thereby its ability to capture and process more complex features within its input sequences. So this expansion, this linear projection is a critical aspect of the member architecture, allowing it to perform some sophisticated sequence modeling task, computationally efficient. Great. Yeah, I showed you here this linear projection layer up and then back here to a reduced output space. You notice what I just wanted to mention here on this dimensionality expansion, let's call it this way. You know, in the old classical neural network models, we have that the dimensionality refers to the number of units, or if you think about humans, neurons in a layer. So each human can be thought of as a feature detector with a higher dimensionality, a higher complexity, allowing the model to detect and represent a more complex set of feature or patterns within the input data. So in the context of the number blocks now, expanding the model dimensionality means also increasing the number of units in a particular layer or in a set of layers. And this expansion factor in a member block is a predefined parameter that we, as coder, say, and it determines how much a dimensionality is increased. For example, in the study, they use the factor of two. So this factor controls the extent to which the input data is transformed as it passes through the block. A higher expansion factor would mean a larger increase in dimensionality, allowing the model to represent and process more complex features within the data. However, now we come to the argument that this is computational, so simple and linear. If I really build a high, or if I insert here a high dimensionality expansion in the hidden Latin space, this also means I have I increased my computational complexity. Because if I have really some hidden patterns in my input data, I need a space huge enough with enough complexity calculations that it can find those tiny, tiny patterns. So therefore, the expansion factor is chosen to balance the need for complexity in the feature representation with the computational efficiency of the model. And this is one of the questions I have. If I really go to higher computational latent spaces to really have the resolution to power to find my tiny patterns in the input data, where would what would it mean for the computational efficiency? Would it really be have a better computational efficiency than transformer? So these are one of the open questions for me. Okay. The purpose of expanding dimensionality transformed the input sequence more effectively, increasing, yeah, the model gains a finer chronology in processing the input data. Yes, beautiful. And now this means if you look now at language processing, member block with expanded dimensionality can be easily and more effectively differentiate between various syntactic and semantic features in my English input text. Beautiful. So this increases here the performance of my new substituted transformer model we call Mamba or S6. Okay, great. So this is it. I am struggling a little bit with the transition from S4 to S6, and that S6 is so much computationally, so much more advanced than the transformer architecture that I still investigating this model. I still try to understand here the details. I think it's quite early, and you see we have here continuous evolution. Now we are at S6 models. But I think it is interesting if we really have a complete new architecture for our large language model, for our vision language model, this would really be kind of a 
technological revolution, a complete new innovation in AI, if the Mamba architecture would here eclipse the transformer architecture of AI systems. So I just wanted to give you a short introduction to Mamba. I learned a lot of preparing this here, this video here for you and for me. I know I will have a deep dive into some details of Mamba, but if you're interested to check it out yourself, I think if the community starts to pick up, starts to develop here on the principle of Mambas, starts to really explore all the possibilities, this could really be a very interesting model. If, however, it has the potential to surplus here our transformer architecture, that is also constantly evolving. This will be the context of one of my next videos. 